Hello, Brian Sanders. How going, mate? Hey, Marty. How's it going? Yeah, great to chat again. We um we talked a couple of weeks ago for your podcast, and uh, you got talking about all the trips you'd had to Tanzania, and I thought, golly gosh, that sounds like an amazing trip. I want to learn more about it. And you were showing off all your toys and bling, and then I heard a couple of podcasts that you just put out on on your peak human sapien podcast and was completely fascinated by it so um yeah no, i can't wait to see your travel photos travel photos are usually boring but these should be fun ones i reckon uh, yeah i have a lot of them they're they're exciting they're good ones <laughs> hopefully you can share a few in in live is that cool if you just hit Absolutely. um share screen and you can pop it up later but yeah. um yeah, I, I, a few years ago, like my journey with this sort of stuff, like I, I jumped into Rob Wolf and was fascinated with the whole paleo thing. And maybe eight years ago, we went to Vanuatu for a, a family holiday and stayed with these wonderful people and visited their their local village where they tried to preserve their unique culture. It was really amazing to see how they live and thrive and they're beautiful, strong, robust people. And we went back five years later for another holiday because it was so good and we wanted to do this and have the same experience again. Mm -hmm. And we went back to see these people and just five years down the track um, with all the development from the Chinese investment, they're building roads and buildings and um, all the all the locals were basically taking all the beautiful food that they sold. It was like the best tasting food, most vibrant food in the world. They'd take it to the markets sit there all day and sell it and then go buy the Chinese processed, hyper palatable, cheap junk food at the shop next door. And these people, the diabetes epidemic and obesity that's just through the roof. So yeah, it's just um, powerful how much nutrition can change these people that are untouched now. But as soon as we touch them with our processed food, it just changes everything, doesn't it? Well, yeah, it's Western Price stuff a, a century later, yeah. and you can see yeah. it happen in real time. Yeah, 100 years after Western Price, you're out there pretty much trying to take a very similar trek and document it with high-tech cameras and put it out there for your your audience to, to digest, to document these amazing people while they're, they're, they're still, some of them are still in amazing condition. Some of them, some of them, but they, there's so few that are un uncontacted. And we also had some new gadgets even we had ketone meters and blood yeah. glucose monitors that Mary brought. I went with Mary Ruddick, uh, who I did the podcast you mentioned with. Yeah. And yeah, it was interesting. Fascinating stuff. So um, show us some of your toys. You, you had some of your spears. Oh, and yeah. Your, uh... well, <laughs> so I have an arrow from the Hadza. So they make these by hand. And um, yeah, while we were out hunting with them, they just grabbed some new sticks, like cut it real quick. and. And then I carried them back and they just dry them out. And then as soon as we got back, they were by the fire already making more. And That's so cool. Yeah, usually and they, there's metal they just, in that. Yeah, so they usually they just use a pointed stick for it depends on the animal. So the, this one they trade with the Zatoga, which is another tribe that's kind of they do some herding and they do some plants and you know, animals and they do blacksmith work. So they trade with them for the uh, for the arrow tips and they have another arrow tip for monkeys or baboons so oh, these wow. go in it's pretty gruesome where they they go in and then when the baboon tries to rip it out it catches so oh. they're barbed and then wow. they have they have about five different arrows with different tips for the different animals and they just walk around with them all in their hand and you got this cool necklace that's hanging off your uh, oh yeah I got your this microphone one. got the maasai one for the women back there and maybe this story will come up later where uh, this machete comes into play <laughs> that I made it through customs with. That's impressive, but I think that's just the start of the the exploration of impressive, mind blowing stuff we're going to go through today. I'm so excited. Um, so how do you organize a trip to Tanzania to visit these untouched people? Is it something that's a a regular tourist thing that people can do easily? Mm -hmm. Obviously, if, if everybody could do it, it'd be um it'd affect them even more and more wouldn't it so how did you get into these yeah. fairly untouched people it, well it's possible to do for normal people it just takes a lot of planning luckily mary did it all she's familiar with africa she lived in zimbabwe for this this whole past year actually and so she kind of figured it out wrangled all the people it's a lot a lot of work and especially 
getting through the tourist stuff because there is tourist stuff out there. And mm. when we talk about the Hadza, we were with the Hadza group and a tourist group showed up and they were kind of like, ooh, like let's take pictures and you know, what, what is this? And then they left and it was just kind of yeah. weird. But we didn't want to end up like them, right? If we didn't want to be those people plan correctly that you might just get that i'm like no no no. we're going to hunt with them and spend time with them and come back day after day and talk with them and see how they live that's so cool so why did you make the effort to to go to tanzania um oh, to, to, went to uganda the, as well too yeah oh, uganda uh, as well yeah so yeah. You, you're basically chasing new de- uh, nutrient density in the in the in the footsteps of western a price from 100 years ago that's pretty much the story isn't it <laughs> Absolutely. And Mary's doing more. She went to Greece and she's going all over. I, I hope to continue to do this actually with Mary because she's so savvy with and smart with all this stuff. Yeah. But we, uh, well, mostly for the Food Lies film. So people may have heard about my film Food Lies. I kind of go under that name and social media and what I've been doing for years now. And this is one of the last pieces of the puzzle to get the ancestral story it firsthand, right? We, we have this evolutionary mm. story of Let's, how, how did humans evolve for hundreds of thousands of years back to millions of years to our primate ancestors all the way up through modern agriculture and, you know, going back to people who don't use modern agriculture. And, you know, Africa is one of the few places where they still have these tribes that, that live that way. So mm-hmm. that was kind of the main reason the Maasai and the Hadza uh, and the Pygmies in Uganda were, were who we wanted to visit. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so what's the, what's the weirdest thing you ate when you're over oh, there? Oh wow! Well, it sound like there's I, a fair array. What, what, what did what did you go? No, I'm not going to eat that. Or what was the weirdest thing you ate, and what was the weirdest uh, thing you didn't eat? I'll tell you the the line that cr- I did not cross was the baboon. They brought back a baboon. Uh, we went hunting with the Hudza the second day when an eight hour hunt. They kept going. They left us in the dust. You know, we kept up for half the time. Well, we kept up for four hours and we took four hours home. They got two baboons. They brought them the next day. They waited for us to come back in the morning and they're so happy. And they, it was gross. It was covered in flies. They're cutting it open. It had hands. It smelled bad. Um, we decided to not eat the baboon. So the weirdest thing I ate was the day before was uh, the brains of a tic-tic, which is a little deer, right? These it's a little, little antelope thing, isn't it? Yeah, a little antelope type thing. Um, so when we, we, before we even went on our first hunt, they, a guy got it. I, I don't know what the story was. He was out there on his own, got one. And they just came in, split it open, uh, got, grabbed the guts, give it to the dogs. They actually tried to save it, but then the dogs got it anyway. Uh, so, so they get like the real intestines and stuff out. But then the, the, the stuff's everywhere. Right there's yellow and brown intestinal stools and this and that everywhere, and they don't care at all. Right, they're just chopping away. So immediately they they cut off some liver, and give it. To, they offer it to me, but you, they're used to tourists coming, and they're you know tourists are like, what are you talking about? No but way, I'm gonna I eat just that. Ran in and started eating it, and they're like, what? <laughs> and Whoa, we, respect, we had a, man. <laughs> yeah, we had a translator who grew up with them. He grew up in this area and it spoke fluent, whatever it's called. It's kind of the click language. So it's not Swahili. Swahili is what they speak in Tanzania, but it's they have their own you know, language. And he spoke with them and was saying, wow, yeah, they're not used to people actually eating the liver. So we ate the liver raw. Uh, they cut it up, put it on sticks. They, they did the whole thing around the fire. We were in this nice cave. Uh, maybe I should, should pull this up, but yeah. Uh, then a kid, he's maybe 11, started cooking the head. Ooh, I got to open systems. If you hit Chrome. share. Oh, sorry, I got the share like, Chrome print. stuff. It's, it's wanting me to give permission. Just a second. Uh, it's going to stop if I – is that Okay. It says we quit can, and uh, reopen to, to share screen. Redoing if we need to. Just feeling while Brian jumps back in. Um, technology, hey? Um, 
Yeah, I'm completely fascinated by this stuff and I've loved listening to his podcasts on this and just uh, to document what we ate in the past and understand where we came from and how we used to eat and uh, might seem weird to us now, but obviously it makes these people, well, at least some of them, incredibly healthy. We can learn a lot. And Brian's back. Oh, back. Yeah, yeah welcome. You should be able to share a screen and share your amazing travel photos. Yeah, let's do it's it. Like sure. Grandpa wanted to show you all the slides from his, um, uh -huh. his trip. We're there. Got it. All right. So, ooh, we're in the Maasai. Here's the Maasai jumping. So here they are. They, they're in this cave, and this is like some serious... Like cave dwelling. <laughs> wow. So here's them. They're, uh, here's a little fire. It was just a small fire, really. They have the dogs running around. Uh, the only modern thing they really have is their shorts. They, they like to just get a hold of some like khaki shorts and they wear those. Here's a guy showing up with the tic tic. Oh, he was wow. fired up. Uh, and uh, there's Mary. Oh, here's the tic tic with the. Uh, the guts. Let's see if we can press play here. Yeah. See, they put it up in the tree there, and then the dogs got it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a the liquor guts. you can see. Um, let's go back. So this kid started cooking the head. So they cooked the head over the fire for quite a while. And then he just grabs it and starts gnawing on it. He was just all about getting in there. Wow. And uh, I mean, they don't use salt. It was, it was really interesting. They don't use seasoning, salt, anything like that. And they just, they don't want it. They'd be getting they, a lot from the sort of, blood, wouldn't they? Yeah. I mean, same thing with the Maasai. Is they, they, Maasai will get more blood because they have the cows and they drink from them. Mm -hmm. But they get enough minerals, I guess, and salt from just the blood. And um, so, yeah, this was... So eventually he, he scored the sides and so he could get the skin off and then put put it back on. And then eventually the brains were cooked enough where we opened up the skull and ate them. So, and it, that was the, that was the best thing I ate the whole trip, actually. The, uh, and you actually enjoyed stuff. that a lot, didn't you? Yeah, it tastes like, it was like pudding. It was just sort of like yeah. this nice flavor. So here's our crew. This was our guide. This is, uh, yeah, just like a little crew. There's Mary. That's awesome. And where did you stay? Did you stay with them or did you just stay somewhere else and come back for the days? For the no. day trip? Yeah, you don't stay with them. I don't know if that's even possible, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, yeah the, we just went back. We had a campsite. So we, yeah, we were sleeping in tents. It was, it was the real deal. Sometimes there was other times where we actually had a, you know, proper lodge. But uh, yeah. Here's, and did here's you get photos video. of the, the poop soup that you talked about in the podcast? Oh, yeah. So that was with the Maasai. Uh, <laughs> I'll grab that. This is, oh, wait, where's Maasai? What an adventure. Yeah, this, that's a whole story. So the Maasai, they butchered a goat for us. We drank the, mel the blood just straight from the cow or the goat. Sorry, I'm like distracted while I open this. Here's the goat uh, up roasting by the fire. And here is the poop soup. So they took all the guts of the goat, the stomach and the, the contents of the intestines, you know, partially digested poop, basically all of it. And I, the, the whole thing, like I saw the rectum, like it, it flipped over at one point. I was like, oh, okay. I see what we're working with. And basically herbs and seasonings already mixed into the uh the meat yeah they had they really just had this one root you know that we thought they were going to put a bunch of herbs because they kept talking about the herbs and this med medicinal stuff but really yep. i mean this is just charred stuff and there's just this one root there was a peppery root and they cooked this down for hours and then they took all the guts out and then it was just this brown liquid that smelled like diarrhea and and then we you just drank it and i I didn't think it, Mary actually drank it because I was gone, but she she said she drank it, so I drank it. And and uh, it tasted like poo. 
Oh yeah, it was just straight diarrhea. It was it was terrible. <laughs> It was, it was, so, it was insane. So, 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 tell me about the hygiene. Like, uh, the the hygiene observations. Like, are they sick? Are they weak? Are they? Uh, oh no! Disease? This is how they they survive. This is how they thrive. I mean, this has been my strategy since COVID. Just, I want to be exposed. I don't wash my hands too much in general. I don't do all these hygienic practices, and it was all confirmed with them. Like I was saying, when they opened up the Dick Dick, it's not like they have any soap or water. They don't have anything. They don't even have water. They barely even drink water, which is crazy. The but knives are never clean. The bowls are never clean. Enough, yeah, nothing's clean. Everything's just there. Like This bowl was not clean. It's drinking the blood out of it. The, the Everything has flies on it. And I never felt better. The whole trip, I didn't have the slightest stomach discomfort one time. Zero yeah. times did I even think wow. about my stomach or have any sort of weird experience. I was a hundred percent great the entire time. Yeah. It's, it's amazing that someone even from the outside, who's not adapted to that area, didn't have issues. I suppose you're probably a bit more resilient than the average white man from LA, but um, yeah. So uh, tell us about some of the observations about the conditions and, and what they, their health and and what they didn't particularly that the messiah it seems like a fascinating story that these people who were eating meat blood and milk just seem to be the peak specimens of humanity that you've ever seen yeah they were I mean, the messiah the messiah were, were, what's that <laughs> they're eating poop why is that yeah i mean maybe that's the secret maybe we all need to do that no they the messiah especially were just absolutely healthy just the and the more uncontacted they were outside the city the healthier they were right mm -hmm. and we saw all stages mary and made sure to plan and we saw them living in the city in arusha and they just were like americans you know mm -hmm. just eating living like americans the same visible sort of sickness as americans just overweight sitting around lazy just type just not looking good and then the further we got out to where we were actually just out in the middle of nowhere they were the healthiest tallest most robust we asked them many questions about do they have pr problems with their back do they do they connect they not sleep at night do they have problems with their period for the women do they have problems with pregnancy it was just no no what are you talking about no what is that just no clue what we were talking about anything they're just like no we just there's nothing wrong with that. We just live. There you doesn't do. seem to be anything that they, oh, any ailments. And then they just, it seems, and we're talking about the older generations. So we were with the older gentleman who kind of was our guide. He spoke English and told us that that's the way his, his dad died at 110. I always forget if it's his grandfather or his dad, but he says he was about 110 and he just died in his sleep. It's like they just die of old age. And then he's saying there was this sort of linear decline as the new foods came in and the new lifestyle came in that they would then get more disease and, you know, have different problems. But just the older generation seemed to just not have disease. They had the the live long and drop dead type of thing. Mm -hmm. Did you find the people, the, the, the Maasai in the city eating the Western food? were of worse health than the, the average white man. I know in the Aboriginal Australians and the, the people from Vanuatu and Papua New Guinea, when they're exposed to these food, it's like they're especially adapted to store energy really effectively. They're really insulin sensitive. They've got a, uh, I don't know whether it's a, maybe a, a high personal fat threshold so they can store a lot of energy before they get diabetic. But once they get diabetic, they're a complete mess metabolically. So it seems like they're, at risk even more so than than um, a lot of Western people mm. for these accentuated diseases. Did you see that with the Messiah or the Hazda? Well, we didn't. So I didn't spend too much time in the city, uh, thankfully. <laughs> well, it's it not what you were there for. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, we didn't see it. But I know that happens, and I'm familiar with that concept around the world, and yes. And I did see in Uganda what I did see. Wait, part of the thing is, they don't have all the Western foods yet. So maybe mm. in Vanuatu, it's different, right? Because it's more, mm. 
it's closer or whatever it is in where i was in tanzania they could not afford mcdonald's they right. they had one pizza in the whole the big city had one pizza that i saw there was no other rest fast food stuff one pizza and it was empty and we, we were there multiple days because it was by this little town center and the only people in there were just white people right there was like three <laughs> white people in there who were just tourists like no one no one goes so to the tourists are in pizza hut yeah they, they they don't have you can't afford this stuff right so what we're seeing i think is that transition stage where they don't have tons of this the new stuff the new foods pumped in so they're not as sick and they mm. don't get you know what you're talking about so rapidly like mm. yeah the native americans that happens to them very rapidly i know that mm. right so they don't really have that and uganda was especially interesting because I, I think they're sort of less well off as a country. And so they really have nothing to do with fast food mm. and everyone just eats whole foods. But what's creeping in is the maize flour. So they mm. have the, you know, the corn flour, the, the, the big thing is they don't prepare it properly. So mm. in South America, they have a five step detoxification process for flour, mm. for corn. Right. And they, it's called nixtamalization. Some people may have heard of it. It goes along with all this Western price stuff that people may have heard mm. of about soaking, sprouting, fermenting, mm. right? Nixtamalizing. It's one of the things that the ancient cultures that ate these plant foods did them in a healthy way, right? Mm. And it was getting out some of the anti-nutrients and getting more of the nutrients available. And they, that, that practice didn't make it over to Africa. So they were just taking the maize, and grinding it and then making food out of it or yeah. worse was they're taking the the maize flour and then making it into a tortilla like a flatbread a pita type of thing and just dousing it in cooking oil they just yeah. call them cooking oil so they're getting all the vegetable oils the seed oils and those are just coming in so this is a transition period they don't have fast food they don't have sodas they can't afford them they did you know there, there was a little bit for tourists I don't think they, they can, they would never buy a soda for like a dollar, whatever it was. Kind of they wouldn't afford it. They could get like 20 bananas. They could get probably 30 bananas for it. They eat a lot of bananas in Uganda. So they weren't eating these things. Um, this was the biggest surprise. Yeah. This where I thought, or the perception maybe in the States or other countries, uh, just Westernized countries think, oh yeah, you, you eat fast food and you get fat and sick. It's not that it, you can get, Fat and sick from just these seed oils and mm. I guess the, the flour that wasn't prepared properly and they didn't even really have sugar. So that, yeah, that was a surprising part is, but I, it, it, took, it seems to take a while to catch up to them. So mm. in Uganda, everyone there between, you know, whatever we, we saw maybe teenagers to 45 year olds looked fine. Everyone's in shape. Everyone looks good. They're fine. They are not starving. So I don't know if people think I, I, I've put some posts out and there's commenters saying, oh yeah, the, the they're, everyone's thin in Africa because they're starving. Cause I put up a obesity map of the world and you know, Africa and a few other countries were the only ones that weren't obese. No, no, that's like from a commercial from like 10 years ago. Plenty of food. Yeah. That, that's, that's a, I mean, maybe in some, really arid countries maybe in some ethiopia or some like desert places that maybe they don't have food but maybe they don't people don't really live there anymore but all throughout tanzania and uganda they have food it's mm. just you know whole foods it's they grow their own food no one's starving at all and i didn't see any malnutrition at all mm. and but they so they had enough calories they're doing fine and so they're all healthy they all look good until they're this middle age and so we see all the cooking oils coming in to the market, no sweets, no treats. The only market I've ever been to in the world, you know, these outdoor markets that doesn't have all the sweets and treats and this and that. All it is is whole foods, right? Wow. So whole 100% whole food market plus Gatorade bottles with cooking oil in them, <sighs> right? And so they're spraying this oil and everything. And then once you hit 45, this is my, yeah. you know, just my observation, gigantic women gigantic 300 yep. pounds like wow. american size like disneyland in a scooter woman 400 pounds like giant women and there weren't many men around of that age because maybe they're at home or doing other work i don't know where they were but when we did see a man 
at that age, big pot belly. Yeah. Right. Like I wasn't as big as a woman, but just big old mm. belly. So mm. I, I don't know. That's my observation. It seems like you can do okay. It just catches up to you later in life. Mm. Maybe this metabolic damage. Yeah. Again, in nature, um, you never get the fat and carbs together really. And in, in, you know, winter you've got the, the protein and fat and summer you've got the maybe more carbohydrates. And in, in spring you've got the protein and fiber and in, in autumn you've got the fat and carbs occasionally just for a short period to make you fat. But, you know, you give them oil and they mix it with maize and they know, everybody knows intuitively how to make that hyperpalatable combination of mm -hmm. foods that will make them, give them energy quickly and, eventually make them fat and catch up with them it leads to major disease so you you went to the hospitals and and covid clinics and the like to tell us about that you you wanted to check out what was going down yeah and we also had to just do our tests and it was really interesting that it wasn't a problem there i they didn't know it existed i mean maybe some people knew it existed i mean if you go to the airport they they had masks and rules but otherwise it did not exist and it kind of goes along with i've seen some of this data about the obesity and the you know lining up with the cases and deaths with COVID, and it fits right along with it mm. you know they so it's it's not only someone said oh well tanzania the government's trying to you know cover it up or not report well i mean yeah we went to the hospitals because we were trying to do interviews with the, the doctors and stuff and <laughs> It went to the coffee. It was empty. Like we were the only people there at some of these places. So yeah. I don't know. I can't, I have no idea. Maybe I didn't see the right thing, but I saw 25 people in one van that were in a, in a small van, just crammed and not, no one even knew what a mask was. So there's no social dis distancing going down there. There was so no maybe it's a combination of activity, lack of obesity, nutrient density, plenty of sun, getting vitamin D naturally, and then good gut health from whatever they're eating in, in their natural environment with a lack of hygiene, which builds the resilience, I suppose, where uh, we don't have any of those things in our Western world most of the time. It's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. So um, you tested their, talking of testing, you, you talk, tested their glucose and ketones. What did you, I think you said one that. guy was 67 who was fit and active, um, 67 millimole, milligrams yeah, per decimal, we, sorry. Yes, yes. So we, we got the elder um, Maasai man, and he was, I think he was in the 70s. Everyone we tested was in the 60s, 70s. And then the one person was, um, so I mentioned the Hadza had the different tourist groups coming in, right? So they were, mm -hmm. this one was especially, you know, set up for tests, I guess. They had that cool cave, which I showed the photo of. And yeah. they would give treats nonstop. And they smoke a lot of tobacco and weed. There's like bush weed everywhere. Uh, not that that has to do with their teeth or their blood glucose, I guess. But they just get a lot of stuff in, right? And their teeth were bad. So these were the only bad teeth we saw were these mm. tourist Hadza group. And we actually saw a different Hadza group that wasn't touristy. And they were all perfect health, just taller, more robust, better, everything, perfect teeth. So it was just <laughs> interesting that this tourist group was getting the treats from the tourists so they would show up even we did like sort of accident not accidentally but you know mary brought this honey candy from greece it was just two ingredients it was just honey and sesame seeds mm. and we gave it to them they just gobbled it down right anything we anything they got they just they scarfed down because it's this novel treat mm. and this guy took gobbled the main chief ate the honey treat and then we, we were like, oh, wait, we were going to test your blood glucose. We wanted to do it before you ate. And then Mary's just like, all right, whatever. We tested his blood glucose. It was like, do you remember in the podcast? It was like 170, 180? Yeah, I thought she was saying it was, Mary was saying it was in the 200s, 260. Two, maybe it was, was 270. It was something, yeah, he, maybe I'm. He was fully diabetic. It sounded like the chief was getting all the lollies from all the tourists. <laughs> he got, he got like the lion share of but it, it wasn't yeah. going good for him. It was really bad. It was two seven. Yeah, maybe it was. And then it was just interesting that a uh, older gentleman in that tribe didn't want any of the, the sweets. 
Mm. And then we tested his blood glucose and it was 77. Mm. You know, Perfect. and tested mine. It was also interesting because I, I was, I don't eat like tons of carbs mainly, mm. but I was eating them in Africa. You know, we were just eating all these whole food carbs. I was eating them the night before. I had tons of bananas and fruit, whatever they gave us and meat. And I had a 71 the next morning and I had ketones and all that. But yeah. um yeah, uh, it was interesting. So they they didn't really have ketones though. Also, they all had 0.1. They were just like this very mild amount. Yeah. Of ketones. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. It goes in line with uh energy toxicity if, if you're metabolically healthy and you're below your personal fat threshold you've got plenty of storage in your in your sponge in your belly and your bum to absorb all that extra energy and it doesn't flow over into your bloodstream in the form of glucose ketones or free fatty acids so again there's no need to celebrate massively high optimal ketone levels just for the hell of it it's not a not a sign of victory it's maybe a yeah. sign of developing diabetes exactly yeah oh, fascinating stuff um so did you have any more photos and and they were so cool yeah from, I from, show well, some other tell, tell us about the, the differences between different tribes i think you said the the maasai were just this picture of glowing health and radiance they were yeah so and they were they're a lot taller they're known to be taller here was the old older gentleman clemens who talked with us from the maasai oh, gee. Uh, I think he says he was in his seventies. Yep. Yep. He, good teeth. Um, he was just sharp. He was running up hills. He wore soccer cleats. It was funny, and he would just go on. He would like <laughs> run up hills. And Mary said, he's got some yeah. serious fangs going on, hasn't he? He's got some really good teeth. Oh yeah, and Big smile. Uh, he. He, he was running up hills and it wasn't even winded. Mary was like, oh, yeah, we ran up the hill and I was so winded by the time we got to the top and he was fine. Yeah. And so that was interesting. Uh, I want to find, oh, the second group of Hadza. This one, this girl was so, look at this girl's teeth. So this these Hadza were just like living in grass huts. Do you see those teeth? Wow. Full, Huge. full all the way back look at those like i had eight teeth removed you can see all her teeth are there <laughs> no dentist never heard of a dentist i mean these people were in the grass hut like on the ground mm. just eating like jenna cats and tubers and you said some of the goat was pretty chewy but most of the food was pretty soft yeah the goat i mean I don't know if they had a bad goat or I think it was stressed out because we kind of took forever to get over to them, but it was very chewy and no yeah. salt. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, maybe we talk about the salt and the water. That was interesting because yeah. they, the Hadza did not really seem to need water. Like we were going on these long hunts with them. Here's the chief. So you can see, I don't know if you can see his oh, teeth wow. are not good. But he's he still oh, wow. is thin, very thin, right? He's even though he's diabetic, with his personal yeah. glucose, thin and wiry guys. But uh, yeah, he's got a very very low personal fat threshold. Something and then oh, this was our our translator Joseph. So he was seemed like the truly healthy guy. He wow. he's Iraq is the is his tribe name, and he was just the picture of health and then you can Looks see really next, radiant yeah and then the chief with the bad That's teeth chief. you can Getting see all the different lead. arrowheads they have too uh, uh, it's, it's they, tragic and heartbreaking that these people are it won't be too long before you won't be able to get these sort of photos of them in their original peak condition and we'll sort of forget what these people ate other than your doco and western a price and a few other it, it really seems like the end I mean, we're we're at the real tail end because we couldn't find them. Like everyone had some kind of modern food in. And then here's the water I was mentioning. So they didn't really drink water. And then the, here's that same kid. So he climbs up into the baobab tree, and there's just a little crook in the tree that collects yeah. water naturally. And they take an empty fruit, and the water is pure brown. We we saw the water in a water bottle, and it was pure brown. <laughs> 
<laughs> did did you yeah. take bottled water or what did you drink? Yeah, so we took bottled water, but on, on our hike, we didn't take enough. And we actually gave it to them. They'll take water. They'll take anything, yeah. really, that you yeah. give them. But, and they uh, cut we, the lid off. They don't open it. They don't unscrew it. <laughs> that was so funny, them cutting the lid off. They, you just had no time to figure out how to open it. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, bring out my machete. Did you have a machete story? Oh, well, that was in the sit in Uganda. Here, here's the honey. Here, maybe I'll show this honey. So we they, they made the fire very quickly, you know, with a yeah. stick and the, the little handful of brush and chopped open. One guy brings an ax and they chopped open the, oh, this is a better video. Chopped open the tree. You can see where they chopped it open right here and uh, just smoked them out a little bit. But I uh, just started grabbing it and eating it. Sweet. It was interesting. I, I think this this honey they got wasn't uh, prime, right? It was it was a little bit empty. Yeah. Oh, here's another uh, uh, bush baby. So they hunt these little bush babies. Oh wow! And they get them like right in the head. Every animal I saw, they got them right in the head. It's it's amazing. What what is it? Is it like a it's it's like a little, a little thing. yeah. They just got a bush baby huh. back there, and now they're looking for a they they're just sort of savages. They kind of just roll. They just like tied it onto their belt and kept going. Yeah. But uh, oh, and this dog too. This dog got kind of mauled by a baboon, and it was just healing up and went along with us on the full hike. And that was about a right. week ago, wasn't it? But it was just healing fine. Yeah. Here's this. Um, oh, wow. This is the gruesome one. I don't know if you want to see this. That's the baboon. Oh, wow. They're that willing just, to eat Willing to eat that. That's a bit too human for your liking, isn't it? Yeah, that's no fun. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, the machete. Well, uh, the city life in Uganda, I would not recommend. We got yep. stuck in Kampala in traffic, worse traffic than in LA. And wow. right in front, in, our driver was telling us to put our phones away, even though we we're in the car, in the van. And right in front of us, they said they, they just open, just steal it right from your hands. And right in front of us, they just, this gang of dudes just came up and took someone's phone in a car in front of us and just walked off. Just and broke so the I had the machete, I had the machete w waiting the whole time. <laughs> Just, I seriously unwrapped the machete from my bag and just held it in my hand and was ready for these guys because it was it was just getting into nighttime. And, oh man, I was ready. And we also got detained in Uganda uh, on the the road there. We did a ten hour drive and it's uh, a little bit sketchy. They they just made up some bogus thing that we ran from the last checkpoint and just we were detained for an hour with. And while they shook down our driver to get money and we had no idea what was going on this was like our last day when we we're trying to get on our air, air flight home and uh, finally yeah they, they let us go because the driver ended up paying yeah wow so where do you think these people are going to be in another hundred years like you've documented a hundred years from western a price what do you think it's going to look like in another hundred years oh man I think they're going to be like the U.S. I saw these dietary guidelines that the, the same type of stuff that's been going on in the U.S., the same thing, meat's bad for you, saturated fat's bad, you know, eat, we need to eat grain. The same messages are coming in, and we, we saw it. And they had this cognitive dissonance, so they knew. Everyone we asked what is their favorite food, they would say some sort of animal food, meat or milk or whatever. And then we would ask them, what's the healthiest food or what help, what food would you feed mm. your, your baby or what they're like, you know, meat, milk, blood, whatever. And then we'd ask them, you know, more questions like, oh, but then, okay, so what are most people eating now? Or what is it? What is What are they eating at the schools or what, what, what are the doctors say are healthy? And they're like, may ugali, which is their porridge and maize. And it's just made mm. from water and, and maize flour and sometimes even vegetable oils and sugars are put in it. And so they, they're getting these same recommendations so that they don't get it. They, and they don't realize, you know, I said that they said the older generations were healthy and living longer. And then they were saying the younger generations are 
less robust. And then they're saying the kids are getting sicker and sicker, yeah. right? And then they're but you're they're saying they fed this I'm food in. at school. The, the sort of educated and fed at school so they come home and tell the family that this maize and oil is a great food and we should all eat more of it yeah so exactly and that was this cognitive dissonance so they because we we're trying to interview them we even had this thing we called the tribe of elders where we had a whole group of of the elderly from this uh, another village that was a farming village and they all said the same thing meat is healthy our our we used to eat meat, our grandparents used to eat meat. Now we just have vegetables and maize and flour, but they didn't put it together. They're, they, you know, they'd say they're all less healthy, but they didn't mm. understand it because their doctors or the, the recommendations were that they were healthy, mm. but they couldn't put it together. They're like, well, the, you know, our grandparents didn't eat this stuff and they were healthy. And they were great. And it, it was just so weird to see them try to explain this to us and they couldn't figure it out. And they didn't yeah. put it together and it was very consistent. And so the propaganda is real. And then, but then certain people did have it kind of figured out mm. like the older gentleman, the Maasai sitting in the chair, I showed, he was very interested in only eating the, the traditional foods. You know, he was very adamant about it. He was very skeptical of foods with a long shelf life. Yeah. So that was interesting. He was telling us about the uh, oil. He's like, no, we don't want the vegetable oil in the store. It lasts forever. You know, Not good. I had a very crazy picture of the rows and rows of vegetable oil. It looks oh, yeah. like I've a got the same thing in Vanuatu. It's just mind blowing in these Chinese fast food stores. But I was going to say, like in Vanuatu, the it's a sign of success if you can buy white man food because you've earned enough money by selling your amazing fruits and vegetables that you're now bored with to all the resorts and you can buy these Oreo cookies. And, and we went to visit a local village near the resort we were staying at to see how they live and lined along the, the road is all these packets, these little shop packets of Oreo cookies. These people yeah. are just burning through the Oreo cookies and they're paying the price and, and what do you live on it it's like flour and oil because that's the cheapest food and we don't have to but all these beautiful foods growing in the backyard but when those foods are available even if the other foods are free that, that's what they it's what you want to eat because it gives you that double dopamine hit that you just can't stop eating so not surprising there's a cognitive dissonance there and a struggle to go yeah, well, it's really nice. It. There's some old people that go that it's got a long shelf life. That's not how our ancestors ate, and that's not how I want to eat. And our young people shouldn't be eating that way. Yeah, it's great that there's a few of them remaining, but people are telling doctors are telling them the opposite, and they're saying no, you're going to get a heart attack if you eat meat. So it's, it's confusing for them. But I think one of the big problems. This is what I always think about <laughs> is all this nutrition stuff constantly. But the part about how it takes so long for things to show up, right? The, it, mm. you, you don't just eat the Oreo cookie and you, you get sick. It's mm. that's why they can't figure it out. Right. So we, mm. it makes sense. They, they are not study, even, even us in these advanced states and countries can't even pin it down. We try yeah. to do nutrition studies and still, there's still arguments. People are just like, no, just eat less calories. <laughs> like, you don't know what, we still can't really connect it because it takes so long for the problems to develop. That's a real tragedy. Yeah. So what are you eating back in America? You, you're doing the regular poop soup? Is that what you're doing now? Or how, oh, how do you man. interpret these learnings in your American context? Yeah. You're in LA, aren't you? I'm in LA. I'm getting out of here in about eight days. I can't wait. I'm over it. Uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of California anymore. And the, I'm going to Texas where you can be free. Um, <laughs> it's all, yeah. Actually, no, honestly, it, it's really funny because every I, I'm still single. I go on a lot of dates uh, with girls in LA that will not eat meat. Like every, it seems like every girl I meet, I haven't met one that eats red meat. Like no one, none of them. They're either vegan. <laughs> you want to go to the te Texas where they want to eat big steaks. Seriously. Seriously. Like it, it's, it became a problem. I'm like I can't. <laughs> Date a girl because they all immediately they just talk about how they're vegan. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm back here. I, I'm I'm eating my meat still. I'm still and ruffling feathers. People don't really understand it in LA what I'm doing. But now that I'm back from Africa, and I, I can at least tell them my firsthand experience. You know about 
why this is healthy and what I observed yeah. and that, well, really it's just about whole foods. Uh, that's mm -hmm. always been my thing. Uh, yeah. I don't know if people know, you know, who I am or what I do or my social media, but it's sometimes it seems like, you know, there's this carnivore crowd that, and there's all these different, you know, really animal based crowds and they're just like plants are bad. I, I do eat an animal based diet, but I have really seen the full, the full spectrum of, things and and different diets and and know how they can work and uh yeah we, like you and i are, are very on the same page of nutrient density is key mm. just enough protein is key and mm. it doesn't really matter that much beyond that uh, yeah. I, I, I would say eating seasonally is key because i think where people run into problems with anti-nutrients is they're eating kale spinach shakes every single day or something which was what i did for years ago and I, I think I ran into some problems because that's not natural. I mean, that's not what I saw in Africa. They, they were not eating, you know, they didn't have access to the same things every day or every month. It was very seasonal. They ate what they have. Change and go around and there's yeah, different you food. That, right. You never overdo one food source that leads to overeating or dysbiosis if you got bacteria. Or too much oxalates or too much whatever. So... So that's what I said. So it's, it's about whole foods. It's, um, it's really about proper preparation techniques, which I mentioned they did in, you know, South America and got the, the bad, you know, there's lectins, there's phytic acid, there's all kinds of stuff in the beans and corn mm -hmm. that they got out and then they could do fine. And so you see in Africa, the problem starting to develop even without fast food, without sugar, because they weren't preparing food properly. It, right with the maize flour and they had the seed oils so we do that at the extreme end in the westernized world where almost none of our foods are prepared properly mm. you know like all the like the bread is not real bread this is I, i'm a big fan of dr bill schindler which he's an archaeologist yeah. paleoanthropologist food scientist studies this stuff he's like it's a bread is not the same like you can have wonder bread is nothing like a traditional so fermented sourdough bread Right. And so that's another big takeaway I saw is like if you prepare things properly, and some of them were semi properly, they would do things very like these long, they would soak beans overnight and they do stuff like that. Right. We don't do that here. Mm -hmm. So the cultures that still do these preparation techniques, it, it, they, you can eat just about any of any whole food and be completely fine. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. So if the current trend, like maybe we're 50, 100 years ahead of Uganda, where does our Western world end up if the current trend continues? Where do you see us? In oh. a, what's, your, what's your dystopian nightmare, Brian? Wally. I never saw the movie. But <laughs> that That's a great movie. Where everyone's in the scooters, like obese. Yeah, yeah. yeah they fall off the little scooter and they get put back on by the robots. Yeah dead serious so my my future vision is two like almost two different species we're gonna we're gonna split paths i really see this i'm, I'm serious also why i'm going to texas i'm getting i know there's people out there that are into regenerative agriculture whole foods all this type of eating they mm. want to own their own land they want to be on a farm they want to or just be in the city and, and live more ancestrally and so there's going to be these, these group of people that, that are paying attention and they're getting outside, they're doing all the things we mentioned, mm -hmm. and they're going to be healthy and they're mm -hmm. resisting, they're bucking the system, you know, they're doing everything the opposite kind of, of, of the guidelines. They're not washing their hands, you know, <laughs> they're, they're, they're doing these things. And then there's going to be the people who just keep going down this path and end up like Wally. And it's going to be sad, but I, I, I mean, all we can do is, is go off into your tribe or make your little community or, or just mm. do it on your own. Yeah. I don't think you can save everybody because there's such momentum behind that. And so much commercial interest keeps selling people the most cheap, nutrient poor, hyper palatable foods. But I just say, you know, for the half a percent of people who want who want to be part of that other species that is more like the messiah than the people in Wally. Um, let's create a system that allows them to pinpoint 
what is more optimal for them right now to move towards a more nutrient dense whole food diet that will also regenerate the planet because anything grown in anything that contains nutrients has to be from recently from the earth it's not going to decay um, it's vibrant because it's full of um full of nutrients and, and it tends to involve animals somewhere in that production and mm-hmm. that um, Littlest Biggest Farm movie that you mentioned, we went to the movies and checked that out after you mentioned it in one of your podcasts oh, yeah. and just mind-blowing the vibrance and beauty that happens when nature works in synergy the way it's meant to and produces this food that people will line up and pay huge amounts of money for because it just tastes so different and you know it's good for your body. So once we help people know that they need to pursue that food then it'll it'll change a part of the world and it'll regenerate not just the humans but the earth that that food has grown in and the animals and the ecosystem and make a more resilient little you know maybe a garden of eden that well uh, you know well i'm 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 speaking crap now but you know it's exciting to vision what we could achieve i think it's you know things are cyclical and things have to go really hard one way to come back. So I think all the stuff you're saying is is going to happen eventually. So maybe I'm being too cynical where we're really going to devolve in one way and another group's going to do okay. I I do think that maybe the, the other group will see people thriving and they'll realize that, you know, the fake impossible burgers don't help the environment and you can't Mm -hmm. cheat nature and get around the system and maybe it'll take 20 years and we'll just have more and more mistakes made, more disease, and the big industry will finally come toppling down. I, I think it just it has to swing back. It's just gonna take a while. Yeah. Yeah, good to have you on the journey part of it. I just love how sold out you are to nutrient density. You keep banging the nutrient density drum. Um, yeah, so thank you for working alongside me with that and coming to have a chat. So um tell us about the film that's been in the works. It's been your passion project for a few years. Is is there a time frame? You've got so much great footage now it's gonna take a while to put together. Yeah. I I was trying to get it done by the summer, but I it's almost the summer. The months and days keep rolling on. We're, we're I work on it every day. Uh so yes, I, I had my work session earlier today. And I, I just don't know. I just, I just know it, we're at the, we're in the, the final stages, yeah. and we're, we're already yeah we've got a lot done. We, we we're doing the soundtrack already, custom score. We're doing custom graphics. We've got amazing footage, amazing ideas. Uh, this really is going to be, I mean, in my eyes, the the one just film that puts it all together and just is that masterpiece <laughs> i'm gonna put that in quotes and in my eyes now that really <laughs> that this whole community needs like and not just one community just all anyone and you could say in the whole food space ancestral eating just counterculture against the you know standard status quo this will be that this i think it's going to push two hours you know and just be this audio visual thesis and culmination of everything that you talk about everything that Mm. our good pal dr ted Heyman talks about right getting every good piece of thing that everyone's ever talked about schultz and all her great work and just Mm. getting all the little gems from each person and it takes a long time and it's but it's going to be that good when we're, we're done with it and you could just instead of someone saying okay go listen to 135 hours of peak human or marty's you know you have to read marty's long blog articles and you have to read all you know 200 of them no one's gonna do that there's yeah. gonna be listening might do that but the rest of the world's not but what yeah. they will do is turn on netflix and you know watch some some new documentary that everyone's talking about so that's my goal yeah, i can't wait but it's been a it's been a great journey to watch you grow and interview I don't know, 130 people or something as you've done all your podcasts and learnt from all those people on this journey to build the film and yeah it's going to be amazing so um yeah so where can people catch you you've got peak human sapien 
Yeah, sapien.org, it kind of is an umbrella site and everything branches off. But yeah, foodlies.org is just a film site. And I just do stuff under Food Lies on all the social media, YouTube and Instagram and all that. Cool. That's great, man. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your support. Um, great to be working with other amazing, passionate people to uh, on this little utopian dream that we have to uh, <laughs> save a little part of the community. It really is. It's great. Yeah, it's been great going along for the ride with you as well. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone, for watching in, and we'll catch you later. Cheers. Bye.